basically uh, was working inside uh, the uh, NSA on behalf of the contractor, Bruce Allen. And um, everybody seems to agree that what he released to the public was legal. Uh, either legal as a result of laws that were well known, or legal as a result of laws that were kept very strictly secret. But here's what he basically told us. Uh, he told us, first of all, that uh, the U.S. Uh, has access to most internet firms, especially U.S. headquartered internet firms data, direct access. And what's interesting here is, you know, Google and Apple and everybody denied it, but in reality they denied it because of the, that secret law, which made it their obligation to deny it and made it illegal for them to release the knowledge that they were collaborating. Um, he also released to us uh, the knowledge that uh, the U.S. government has broken most encryption standards, including SSL, HTTPS, uh, and several other uh, meaningful, meaningfully well-adopted encryption standards. And not only have they broken them, they've been influencing the adoption standards themselves in order to plant uh, weaknesses in the encryption standards so that the U.S. would have access to, just by wiretapping the uh, data transfer, would have access to the contents of those secret messages. Uh, kind of interesting. Also released the fact that um, you know, in 1947, there were five uh, countries that had been collaborating with intelligence during the Second World War. They were the U.S., the U.K., uh, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. And uh, he basically released the fact that uh, while it is illegal for the U.S. to spy on its own citizens and uh, spy on American soil, uh, it's not illegal for the U.K. to do that. And so they basically signed this mutual outsourcing deal where the U.S. can't spy on you but the UK can, but the US can collect data and give it to them. So what's really happening is all of the data being collected is being sent over to the UK in a really very large deal so that they can spy uh, on American citizens and American soil. And then of course the Americans are spying on British citizens on British soil all the time. So I think that's kind of an interesting data point as well. Also released uh, information about a uh, software called XP Score. It basically collects metadata about calls, phone numbers, email addresses used, and so on. Collects them in real time. And I thought this was cool. Where is X Keystore? We know they're everywhere, but I don't even know where that stuff around the Antarctic is. I mean, it, basically they have, they have installed servers more or less everywhere to collect all this metadata. And what kind of things does it collect? It collects phone numbers, it collects addresses, it collects instant messenger transactions, it collects HTTP transactions, uh, and all kinds of other user activity. So it also released, he also released information about this uh, software called PRISM. PRISM is uh, basically software that is actually collecting the real data. So it's kind of interesting, you know, uh, you have access to data like Microsoft, Yahoo, Google, Facebook. Anybody ever heard of PalTalk? I don't even know what that is. Yeah. Uh, but definitely Skype and YouTube and Apple is all sharing data directly to uh, the NSA. And what does the NSA do with it? Well, you know, among other things, they actually share it with the FBI. Which I don't know that there's like some kind of constitutional issue here, but apparently it is legal, and um, the president's lawyers have been justifying this as legal. Um, but it was secret. They're also sharing it with the CIA, and we also have news that they do share that data with the DEA as well. It's kind of interesting, um, and they have like this really nice nomenclature for how that data is actually organized and collected, which you know lets you know exactly okay. Can I be subscribed to real-time notifications of a chat login or real-time, can I get carbon copy on everybody's instant messenger transcripts and all kinds of other cool things like that that you can imagine that if you're a spy, you might uh, you know, be able to uh, view. Okay, so also uh, showed us how the, uh, the, excuse me for a second. Shows how the user interface looks, where it's like basically a really nice web page. You know, you get to do searches and it's in a web interface and that's kind of cool. And then, you know, where is the data flows going and how much of the world's data flows do they have just by taking what comes through the US and what comes through the, through the UK. And uh, finally, all right, where are all my data sources and what do I get? And of course, I get even the video transcripts of Skype sessions and uh, of Google uh, Hangouts and so on. Uh, other video conferencing tools and certainly instant messenger and email. So they basically get a lot and, and kind of a good explanation for what they have to pay these companies for access to their data. Uh, and so I mean what is the what do you think the actual infrastructure required to collect all the world's email, instant messenger, and video conferencing? I mean what do you think that would cost? Even just access to the data centers has cost them $20 million a year. We're talking about a very 
big data collection exercises going on here. And as a result, a very expensive data collection exercise. So we don't know exactly where in between of 20 million. We know it's north of 20 million. That's just what they paid these guys. And but this entire apparatus only costs 52 billion. So it's somewhere in between there. We don't know how much of that apparatus uh, is, is being expended. But we do know that uh, basically, uh, you know, this particular incident is extremely costly because it erodes the value of certain secret infrastructure and certain secrets, right? Until this was released, Americans didn't really think that the UK was spying on them, that all this data was being collected in the first place. Uh, they didn't know that encryption was totally broken. So there's like a lot of cool like things that we've discovered, but you can see how the consequences to the NSA make this the new winner of the most costly TCO incident in the history of humanity, beating out Hervé Galciani for his uh, $2 billion uh, release. Um, you know, is this a good thing or is it a bad thing? Are we happy or are we sad that this exists? Do we agree or do we disagree? It's not my place to agree or disagree. Okay? I do think, I do believe this slot. I believe that if you are hunting for terrorists, access to this information is going to help you. And I do believe that terrorists attacking uh, us anywhere in the world is extremely costly as well. So let's not forget the context in which these decisions were made. Let's try and think instead, was there a more responsible way to be stewards of that data given the circumstances? So back to this guy. Well, you know, I, um, I now have about 200 DBAs and sysadmins, and I now have access to about 200 customers' networks. And so you might start to think, okay, so if Paul really understands the nature of total cost of ownership, maybe he should be doing some things to make sure that his DBAs and his sysadmins aren't able or even uh, capable of doing that kind of damage to his customers' uh, infrastructure, and that might be wise. So the way that we connected to customers is actually there's a bit of interesting history. Uh, Pythian uh, was uh, in a Red Creek press release in March of 1999, when uh, until then all of our connections to our customers were with ISDN lease lines. But in March of 99, we started using IPsec. And what's interesting about the fact that we chose IPsec is that we were the first company to ever secure vendor um, client communications over the internet and using encryption technology. And the VP of uh, marketing is Agnes Imre. And at um, Red Creek, she said, well, we're designing our technology to target obvious applications like port-to-port -port VPNs, but this is a neat one. You look at this company that selected this to, to secure vendor client uh, interactions. And you know, we are confident that the growing internet-based data and service industry and need for securing client provider communications will trigger an important new VPN market segment. Well, that entire segment is now the entire VPN market. It's called the extranet market, and a lot of VPNs, the majority of them, are used to secure either employees working from home on the one hand, or to secure client provider uh, network. So we basically bought a thing like this, and it, what it meant is that we created tunnels using IPsec between our network and all of our customers' networks. Well, I don't know about you, but this kind of scared me. So what, what it meant is that one of my DBA's laptops was literally on all of my customers' networks and could route between them. It also meant that because of the nature of TCP IP, once one of our DBAs had a session open to a system, even if we changed the password on that system or, or did other things, at the connection layer, that connection stayed open. So when somebody were to, were to resign or be terminated, we didn't have an ability to shut down their connectivity because of the nature of TCP IP. Um, we also had uh, some issues because our customers had separate security policies, security frameworks. Some allowed this, some allowed that, some didn't allow thumb drives. Some allow virus, some require this version of this virus scanner. And you can imagine how if a laptop is actually networked to all these customer networks, it's impossible for us to be in compliance with the exact details of customers' existing security handles. We also had some concerns along the lines of what does it mean to be responsible CTOs, responsible uh, stewards of our access. So we're thinking, okay, is, is it okay for us to we sleep at night? How can we comply with security policies? How can we prove what we did? How can we prove that we didn't do something if we were accused of doing something? And from the client's perspective, we also had this obligation to try to explain to them how do we go about uh, securing our access to your networks and how do I prove that what I'm doing to your compliance bodies, whether they are PCI or whatever. Okay, 
So now, what we really wanted, we figured, is given the circumstances, we really wanted what's the equivalent of a black box. This is a flight data recorder. You know, they're very valuable in airplanes because what they let you do is they let you basically know exactly what happened. They let you hear the audio in the cockpit, see what all the controls were. This is really what we want. We wanted a robust connectivity framework that would let us connect to multiple customers simultaneously in a secure way. We wanted uh, strong authentication and identification so that we knew uh, with incontrovertible evidence who was accessing ne which network and who was accessing and doing which work. And we wanted to be able to have like, a black box capability that lived at the perimeter between Hithia and the client so that basically I didn't need to install software on 2,000 client systems. I could just install software on the, our perimeter and as a result, everything that would flow through that perimeter, we would have the ability to uh, review. Other design goals that I think are really important is we didn't want something that was Oracle specific. We didn't want something that was SQL Server specific or MySQL specific. Because we're making investments in MongoDB and in Hadoop and in all kinds of other platforms. And let's just agree that you know that most of these technology specific te uh, approaches to uh, privileged access supervision, uh, you know, they're very, very dependent on the versions of the platform. So we wanted to buy this. Basically, we wanted to just show, show some money into a vendor's hands and buy them. The problem is, this was not on the market. What we had, we had Sudo. The problem was Sudo doesn't consolidate logs globally. It's uh, very difficult to live on, on, it doesn't live on the perimeter. It lives on the host. Uh, it only secures text console access. We looked at the technologies from the database vendors. You know, it, it left us with a, a difficulties in terms of uh, adopting random technologies, supporting older technologies, and where the technologies are deployed is also problematic because they need to be deployed on the servers where the platform lives. So we started looking at um, technologies like Database Vault, which is great technology, but again, lives on the platform and relies on uh, Oracle. Uh, McAfee's uh, Centrigo, which uh, is amazing technology and attaches directly to the Oracle SGA, uh, also very sensitive to the Oracle version, needs to live on the server, and it's Oracle only. But okay, maybe it's not so bad that it's Oracle only because Green SQL has a technology that is MySQL and SQL Server compatible. So now at least we got about 80% of the revenue covered, but still it lives on the server and, uh, and needs to uh, uh, basically broker transactions through it. Deep packet inspection and network sniffers we looked at as well. They have a lot of problems in part because, you know, if you can encrypt over it, then you need to have the shared keys there. And then again, what you can see is only inside of packets, which means that you don't actually get to understand motivation or action or any of that. You really just get like deep, detailed logs of what somebody did. Now, virtual desktop infrastructure was a little closer to what we wanted to do, but it was still not quite there. And the reason is that it didn't have this emphasis on supervision and recording. And so yes, there was virtual desktop infrastructure available, but we realized that we would have to build something ourselves. Now, building something ourselves uh, was not an easy decision for us because we are not a software development company. Uh, we are an infrastructure management company. But we thought we could maybe pull it off, and uh, Mark Bewley, who was at the show, uh, uh, made a quick proof of concept. What we ended up building is something that looks like this. Basically, every customer has a separate VM, and in fact, they have three and three separate data centers in Ottawa, in the UK, uh, and in, in uh, Australia. And the reason that we have three is that that, that leads to a robustness rule, right? If any one of our data centers were to go down, we can still connect through one of the other data centers. Every customer's VM, we now have the tunnels terminating inside the VM itself, that our access to the customer is concentrated and bottlenecked. It's no longer corp to corp IPsec, it's now corp to this VM IPsec. And then what we're actually created is a mechanism whereby, see that recording, that security camera in the corner? We created a mechanism whereby when we connect to this VM, we have access to view the video live and view the video uh, in, in a recorded uh, setup. So the way that we did that is we created a man-in-the-middle attack on SSL. So we basically created an SSL port forwarding uh, uh, piece that captures the video of, in the VNC protocol in real time. And we also transcode that VNC protocol, which is the, the view of the screen, into video protocols, uh, specifically AUG. And so you can do things like fast forward and rewind from live, like a PDR of an actual production uh, user session. Because the VPN tunnel terminates inside the triple server, all of our access to the client is uh, basically provably available uh, and uh, live and uh, in posterity to the, to the 
the um, actual work uh, for, the, for the client's ability to view. So if you want to see what this looks like, I have a demo here, and it is I think, decently able to see. So what you see here is a SSVNC client. It's a, it's a standard VNC client, and but we don't use VNC authentication because it's known to be insecure. So what you do instead is you don't put in the password at all, you just click connect. And then the authentication happens here in the actual VNC viewer. And here we have RSA Secure ID multi-factor authentication, which means that at this point, once the session is up and live, we know for sure who it is who is authenticated, and we have this global uh, authentication, centralized authentication framework. From that screen, the DPA or the sysadmin can do all their normal work. They can SSH the servers, they can use GUI tools, they can do whatever they would uh, normally be able to do while enjoying access to a production system. What's special is that on the right hand side, what you see is the security operations view, which we can see as managers and the clients can see as well. Which means they can literally press play on that button and then have access to a view in their website, in, uh, in their web page, of exactly what our DBA or sysadmin or email admin or SharePoint admin <coughs> is doing live in real time. And you can see that it lags live uh, by under a second. So that's already a really nice supervision capability in terms of a security camera, kind of equivalent to you know, the live security that a, a Las Vegas casino might have to be able to view uh, their croupiers as they're enjoying their access to the chips. Other things that we can do is we can send messages to sessions, which is kind of cool because we used to use wall for this in the good old days where you could just basically bang an email out, a, a message out live to all the Unix users connected to a system. But today, people are connecting on so many different protocols, it's very difficult to get everybody to see, okay, call into this bridge, or I'm starting now, or whatever. And so the technology does allow you to send messages to sessions. It also allows you to pause the session entirely, which means that if we generate a signal, maybe through uh, other intrusion detection systems or other abilities to generate signal for a reason that we might want someone to stop, we can actually send a pause to a session in real time, so we're no longer vulnerable to the TCP connection persistence problem, which means that now, if you wanted to pause the session, you do it right from the SecOps view, and that entire session no longer has access to keyboard or mouse. And then finally, we can suspend and connect, disconnect the session in its entirety. So disconnecting the session would be useful, for example, if um, somebody were to resign, and you just want to be able to shut down all of their access and also revoke their privileges for ongoing access. So you can see how right away, uh, the supervision capability and the ability to uh, interject into the middle of the session as it's live is much, much improved. What you can see here is the session disconnecting, but also what we're going to see next is the ability to replay the session after it occurs. So it's the very same session that is going to be replayed on the screen. The functionality of the pausing is another really important roadmap functionality for us because one of the things that the NSA has already said that they want to do see the replay behind me in a second, but while that's playing, let me comment on it. One of the things the NSA is going to try to do is they're going to try to create two-person controls, that no person will be able to work alone on systems. And what we want to do with this pause feature, which is pretty neat, we want to make it so that when you authenticate to a session, instead of having it available live, you would basically get a pause screen, and it would say, well, I'm waiting for the second person. Once the second authorized person connects to the screen, then one of them would have access to the uh, entire keyboard except the enter key, and then the other person would have access to only the enter key and the mouse. And as a result, one person would be able to craft commands but not execute them, and the second party would be able to execute commands but only, but only after having refused them. You can see how this would dramatically reduce the risk of a single person abusing their privilege uh, in terms of access to uh, production data. The other thing that we're doing on the roadmap, I'll show you the next one, is uh, Later. is we're making so the sessions are actually replayable and searchable. So we're doing live OCR, using Hadoop actually, and Alex was in, involved in the project to do this. We're doing live OCR on the session so that when you type select in here, you can see when exactly the word select was on the screen. You can go straight to where in the session that word was on the screen. As you change the word in the search box, you can jump around the session to see exactly when certain keywords were on. If you can imagine the power of that from a root cause analysis point of view, let's imagine that you uh, want to see exactly uh, with what parameters a file system was built. You could literally type NKFS in the name of the file system into a search box 
you, all of the sessions where those two words were on the screen at the same time, press play on the oldest one, and literally watch the sysadmin creating the file system, even if it was two years ago, and, and look at exactly what commands they used, what parameters, what they did 10 minutes before, what they did 10 minutes after. So it creates a really a powerful breakthrough, uh, root cause analysis, audit and revision, documentation of effort, repudiation of work in the event that a system is shut down, and we say, hey, no, no, it wasn't us, we didn't shut it down, we can show all of the sessions and demonstrate that at that moment nobody issued a shutdown of command, and non-repudiation of work, which means that if we say we did do a task, we can prove exactly that we did it, and exactly what commands that we did. So that creates a kind of a, a different dynamic in terms of responsibility and standards of care. So why would we do this? Again, the reason that we want to do this is because of this idea around what does it mean to be responsible stewards of data. So back to Lonnie Anderson. He's the CTO of the NSA. And now you guys saw what kind of data he has collected, right? So it's not to say that he, the data isn't useful, right? Because we remember this, that you know, the, the data being collected uh, is being used mostly by spies and uh, in the service of uh, the nation and so on. But you know that you have a, a kind of a responsibility to be uh, safe stewards of that data. They literally have access to all of your email, you know, all of your instant messenger transcripts, can subscribe to you, sending IMs to your mom. You know, if you have access to that, you, you need to have a certain amount of responsibility. So you might wonder who did uh, Lonnie put in charge of that? And it's this guy, his name is John DeLong. He's the director of compliance for the NSA. And you know, he's the one who writes basically this report, which basically shows Okay, to what degree are we abusing our access to these systems and, and can we measure and monitor our compliance with our responsibility uh, for uh, having access to this data? Well, it turns out that if you look at John's actual uh, reports, you learn a lot of really interesting things. One of the really most interesting ones is that they have a term called Lovint. Lovint is like a third kind of intelligence next to SIGINT, which is signals intelligence, and human, which is human intelligence, and love it is when spies spy on their lovers, or girlfriends, or moms, or prospective girlfriends, or ex-girlfriends. It's basically using and abusing access to the system for your basic, your, your personal uh, requirements and your personal wants and needs, and not in the service of the nation. Well, you might imagine they'd be really concerned about that, and on some level they are. Um, but what's neat about love it? is exactly how they know how many incidents they have. Do you know that they have no idea what the spies are doing while enjoying access to that website? They literally have no idea, and the proof is all of the Lovent incidents were discovered as a result of polygraph tests during people's security renewals. Uh, they literally have no ability to supervise them or detect them in, in real time or anything like that. Now, if that's going to change, the two-party rule, and of course, if you've got two people involved in access to a system, uh, you are not going to be able to spy on your girlfriend quite as comfortably as if you're solo. But at the same time, the key lesson here is if you have a great deal of power, you also have a great deal of responsibility. So while enjoying access to a website like this, uh, I think it's important to, uh, for us to imagine a future, so this is where I put my futurist hat on, a future where the um, the responsibility and the, the power of root, the power of SysDBA, the power of being an email administrator with access to the CFO's email in a publicly traded company, uh, the power of being a SharePoint administrator with access to slide decks of strategic value to your company, all of that power is going to come with a responsibility. It's a responsibility of transparency and accountability, comparable to the kind of accountability a pilot has knowing that that black box is recording all of their actions, recording all of their decisions, and recording all of their uh, uh, interactions with their colleagues to a degree where their work can be replayed and their decisions can then be studied uh, in the result of, of an incident. So this kind of more mature understanding of TCO means that investments in these kinds of technologies are coming down the pipe. So my prediction for you as DBAs, as systems administrators, is that the days of unsupervised access are over, as a point of trivia, um, in 1970, closed circuit television was invented and brought to market. Uh, and by 1975, 100% of all banks had installed closed circuit television systems. And I think the age of Snowden is an age where now that we are aware,
because of that $2 billion incident at HSBC, because of that, uh, I'm, I don't know, I'm just going to estimate $20 billion incident at uh, the NSA, that the TCO, the, the, a more mature understanding of TCO is happening. And we're starting to learn that the consequences of these incidents are disproportionate to the cost of, of preventing them or avoiding them, or at least mitigating the risk of them. And as a result, these kinds of uh, technologies are coming into the marketplace. And so stay tuned, they're going to come to a, a workplace near you. Mm -hmm. And um, with that, I've got, uh, I still got a good, I've got still got 10 minutes for Q&A, which is what I was hoping for. Anything? Yes. So by default, so when we sign on a new client, we're only going to connect them to that system. Now currently we have 200 clients and we only have about 40 migrated to it. So we still have some legacy clients that we have a legacy connectivity method for. All new clients are connecting only to the system which we're calling at Minnesota. Um, what that means is that uh, when they sign on, uh, at our standard and historical price, they have access to the three data centers, the robust connectivity framework. They have access to our strong identification because we are in charge of authenticating people there, including the RSA Secure ID, which means that whether they make investments in Secure ID or not, they immediately have the confidence that our team at least is multi-factored into all of their access. Um, and they have access to the live view feature. Okay? So they have access to the live over-the-shoulder supervision inside their support portal. They can press play on sessions and they can see exactly what's going on live. Uh, for a modest licensing premium, approximately 10% of the value of the contract, we will uh, have session replay starting from the beginning of the prior month. And for a, a slight bump on that, uh, roughly about 20% of the value of the contract, uh, they have access to the entire session history from the beginning of time. Uh, we also have the ability for our clients to also authenticate their DDAs and sysadmins through here, and then we can help them secure their access to their uh, data center so that they would have access to 100% supervision capability of uh, the work that happens. So essentially, in terms of their relationship with us, for every 100 bucks they spend, they have a choice between 100 bucks, get the multi-factor, the live view, or 110, get the replay, uh, that through some root cause analysis, because since the beginning of last month, you don't have like, long-term audit capability. Uh, and for 20% more, uh, they have access to uh, all of the session history. And they record them, and they record your live sessions for the client. I beg your pardon? And they record your live sessions for the No, it doesn't record your desktop. No, it never records your desktop. So this is actually a really important design feature, which is I don't want to record, <laughs> unlike uh, Lonnie, uh, I don't want to record your instant messaging, I don't want to record your email, I don't want to record your web browsing. Uh, you know, for me, what I really care about is what did you do while enjoying access to production? So I'm not interested, like, if you think about it in a banking sector, if they don't put security cameras in the bathroom, it's not interested in your private stuff. They're going to put security cameras in the safety deposit box room because they're interested in what you do while enjoying access that is privileged. So by the same token, it doesn't record my desktop at all. It only record what's happening inside that uh, window into the client's uh, uh, network. Yeah. Okay, so the question is, do we, is it helping us win new business? Yeah, and this is the correlation with their need for the Were there some incidents that said, okay, we have to have this Yes, yes. So there's two, two major factors. But my primary driver in building this was that this is my life's work, and the reputational damage that would occur if, you know, my company was the source of a data leak comparable to the Gunciani or Snowden data leaks, uh, whether, whether there was a result of illegal activity or not, or just theft, uh, it would be a ruining of my life's work. And I mean, I've never sold a share of Pythian. So, I mean, at this point, I own my shares of Pythian and a mortgaged house and 100 shares of Google I bought at the IPO. That's what I own. And so I, I'm not prepared to stomach the, the damage to our reputation that would occur if we were the source of a leak. That's one of the reasons that in terms of my analysis of my TCO, We've made this investment, which is almost $3 million. Uh, we've made this investment in terms of mitigating the risks for our, our world. But what's happened since is now we're discovering that clients are actually really, really interested in this.
clients that used to tell us there's no way you will ever get remote access to our networks see this, and it kind of changes the conversation. And uh, this was not here, right? it's too bad, but he had a conversation at a major financial institution where uh, he was doing some on-site consulting and talking about the technology, and sure enough, the next thing we knew, uh, it made a, a huge difference in terms of their ability to get us remote access to their network. And you know, you can see how the ability to supervise is, a, is an important feature in terms of uh, enabling remote access. So it is, it is helping us a lot. Yeah. Uh, you sell the solutions to other companies? So it is available in a software as a services model now on our same platform. So that if other, especially other service providers who have an interest in securing their access to their clients' networks, uh, can subscribe to this and basically charge their clients more, because I mean it's worth something, but charge their clients more and share revenue with us around deploying it in a software as a services model. Uh, we do have uh, on the roadmap uh, an appliance version of this, and it should be available within a year or so. But right now, it's basically out of that three million, about half of it is just buying our own infrastructure, and deploying it globally, and that's what we've done, and that's what we've been focusing on is, is as a enabling technology for uh, our work. But I mean, I do I do believe that there is an uh, interest in the marketplace for the uh, supervision capability and the multi-person control capability. Um, based on what uh, is coming out of the NSA now, because of the leaks, because of the public pressure, is they're making many, many investments in technologies. I don't know to what degree they're, they're comparable to this, but technologies to ensure that uh, multi-user uh, uh, control is necessary in order to access uh, production infrastructure. You can see how it would be very easy for the NSA to install that web app only on that system, which means that from that moment forward, can't actually do the spying without being spied on yourself in terms of the collection of what you're doing while you're spying, do you know what I mean? So that now they actually have evidence that you're spying on your girlfriend, right? And uh, whereas before they were relying on the polygraph, I believe that these investments are coming down the pipe. Right now they're coming down the pipe for environments that are uniquely valuable and where the cost of that kind of incident uh, already dominates the, old, the, the true TCO picture, what I call the modern TCO analysis. Uh, but I believe that uh, because the systems are becoming increasingly valuable, in many terms that I spoke about in the first uh, slide, uh, as systems become increasingly valuable, this is going to disseminate through the industry. You know, to give you an idea of that, uh, in the banking sector, it took five years for closer intelligence to be adopted. But uh, my partner, Nicole's mom, Gloria, has had a convenience store and it only did a thousand bucks a day of business. And she had security banks for a thousand bucks a day of business. And I just think that over time, none of us are going to be managing systems that are so not valuable that uh, our employers are not going to need uh, or want a supervision capability compared to this. That's my prediction. That's it. Let's see what time it is. If I have, if I have five minutes, oh, I do. I have seven minutes. Okay, so I want to talk to you about this TCO package again. Let's just go back to it. <laughs> Clearly have way too many slides. Okay. So if TCO is made up of these three variables, anything that we can do to reduce the cost of incident also reduces our TCO. And cost of incident is really made up of the risk of an incident times the economic consequence of an incident. Part of the issue with the way Gartner describes TCO is they only talk about risk, but in fact, risks don't cost money. Risks are just a bet you make. It's what it costs when you lose the bet that really is a, a, an economic consequence. So we are thinking deep thoughts and thinking not only about security incidents, but also human reliability incidents. Because, you know, we've always been good at architecture around building reliable and stable systems, right? But where we, where we as, um, as DBAs and sysadmins, where we've been remiss is, is a culture of human reliability that is really much more common in the healthcare sector and in the aviation, civil aviation sector. There's really deep culture around human reliability. And so one of the things that we've done at Pitkin is we created a, a checklist called Fit Acer. Has anyone heard about Fit Acer here? Any non-Pythian employees heard about FitAcer? <laughs> cool. 
So the, the checklist actually is available, and Christina's got them on the desk. But what it is, is a checklist that's meant to be run in real time to reduce the rate of human error. And fit just stands for focus. Are you able to focus on your work? Then identify. Are you on the right system? Just you need dash A. Is it the right time? Uh, is, do you have the authority of, of making the change? You have an idea, we run uh, just nuclear power plants where uh, uh, pressing the enter key without authority is a million dollar fine. Um, and then type the command, which you're going to do anyway. And then assessing the command means alt tabbing and going into Google or TechNet and making sure the command is going to do exactly what you think it's going to do. And then the C in FitAcer is uh, to come back into your window and then check that you're still in the right system. Because the second you alt tab out, when you alt tab back in, you should probably do another quick uni a to make sure you pick the right window. Um, and then E is execute the command, which you're going to do anyway. And then R is review and document that the command did what you thought it was going to do. And then document that you made the change right away. Now, FitAcer is mandatory and can for every command that affects state. But it's not mandatory for LS, but it is mandatory for RM. And it should be able to be running under 30 seconds. Like just, my focus, yes, no. Or somebody, if somebody's screaming by the screaming child, pulling at my sleeve or whatever. Uh, and so when going through the, the checklist in real time has reduced our rate of human error uh, from one per about one year of delivery. So those of you who are DBAs or sysadmins uh, and working in production, uh, you know, if, if you've gone through a career working in production, hands on keyboard all day, every day, uh, you know that a mistake once a year is actually not bad. I mean, speaking for myself, uh, I was not uh, that reliable person. Um, but we now are, are one error of this category per seven years of delivery. So when somebody joins my company, if they make a mistake like that, right, uh, right command, wrong window, right command, wrong time of day, uh, wrong command, wrong parameter, you see where I'm going with this. Um, if they make a mistake like that in their first seven years of service for me, they're bringing our average down. And uh, you can see that that creates a, another major uh, impact on the TCO picture. And again, the impact is really clear because now, and only now, is it becoming evident that the cost of owning a system is driven primarily by whether it's well. When the systems are well, they're free. Right? When the systems are well, you don't have to do anything. It's only when they're not well, and you're dealing with the consequence of an incident, an availability incident, a reliability incident, a security incident, that they really cost a lot of money. And so, I mean, that, that checklist, I, I feel very strongly about it, that everybody should be adopting it, and I have it as free. So just go ahead and grab it at Christine's desk uh, on your way out. So that's uh, another uh, consequence of our thinking about TCO in this way. So one of them is the investment in Miniscope, and the other one is the uh, investment in uh, FitAcer. And uh, you could uh, eventually adopt this, but FitAcer you could adopt today. It really does change your reliability of work. OK, and with that, I think my time is up. Because at 10 to I need to liberate the desk for the next uh, speaker to get ready. And so thanks, everyone. Thank you.